All right, you ready? I know that this is the really hard time to teach because all your food is going to rob your brain of its energy, so just be aware of that. If you need to stand up, I don't mind that. If you need to walk around, whatever it may be. I, I do ministry in the Northwest where nobody respects leaders anyway, so, <laughs> so it's fine with me. I'm kind of used to it. My wife's, I used to do youth ministry at a pretty big church in Chicago, and there would always be kids getting up and going, walking around when I'm talking. She's like, doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, no, there's so many kids in the room that are getting changed by the Lord, it's fine with me. And probably some of them, that's the only way they're going to listen is if they're moving around, because they're, and that's how some of you guys are. You like actually have to be doing something to learn. So if you need to move around, it helps you. It doesn't bother me at all. I think God's big enough to get it through to you, so huh, I'll trust him. Uh, I want to, what I want to do is go to Romans 1 again. Like I said, we're going to go back to that. And um, um, we're going to just talk about, now how do, how do we create this culture where um, it's normal for people to speak the gospel to one another regularly, where every sin and issue that stands in the way of our faithfulness to Jesus' command is ultimately a gospel issue, since sin is the outcome of unbelief, as John uh, records Jesus saying in John 16, that, uh, you know, that the, world, the Spirit would convict the world of sin in, in regards to unbelief in me, and he makes that connection there in John 16. Um, so just knowing that all sin is connected to unbelief, and in particular unbelief, in God, and more particular, as revealed in Jesus Christ. So we, we want to say, how do we create a culture that's normal? And I said this earlier, it's got to start with you. You've got you've to learn how to rehearse the truths of the gospel regularly. You've got to keep going back and saying, how is this in line with the truth of the gospel? You've got to take thoughts captive and say, okay, what, what does this say about what I believe right now about who God is in my life? And so... It, I want to encourage you, it's got to come out of the overflow of your heart first. Uh, you're not going to just start speaking stuff you don't believe. So it's got to be happening before it's going to just come out. So it starts with you. And I, I, the reason why I spent the morning the way I did is because I want to, you know, if, if you don't know the gospel, then gospel fluency won't happen. You know, if, if, you, if you can't articulate it, like regularly I would, with your group, say, okay, what is the gospel again? You know, and see what people say. You know, it's... It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay, well, what did God do to save? Well, God the Son came and lived a perfectly submitted life before God the Father. Because we don't. And God the Son, Jesus, went to the cross in our place as our substitute. God put all of our sin on him, and in exchange we received the righteousness of Christ by faith. And at the cross, Jesus paid for our sin. And Jesus rose again on the third day, conquering sin, Satan, and, and death for us, overcoming all the powers that stand against us, and now by the power of the Spirit, whom Jesus sent when he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, now we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, both to make Jesus known to us so that we might be regenerate by the power of the Spirit and become children of God, but we also now can believe and practice in light of, of Jesus all that he's commanded us to do with his strength and his power. And so you, you, you know, that might be how they say it. So... It's like, okay, that's both the gospel and the implications of the gospel. It's the gospel and what it produces in our life. And, um, and I'll just give you a little warning. I hear a lot of people go like, yeah, man, we, we're, like, we're, we're like doing the gospel. No, you don't do the gospel. The gospel does you. Okay, let's be clear. The God, you don't do gospel. God did gospel. The gospel is the good news of what God has done. You don't do gospel. You live a life in light of the gospel. The gospel is working itself through you. Jesus' work, power is working through you. It's about what Jesus is doing, not about what you're doing. And so Paul says, this is the hope of glory, Christ in you, not you for Christ. And so just keep that order right, because it's really easy to start slipping into this idea that gospel is doing good deeds. And that now we're doing the gospel. It's like, no, 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 you're not doing the gospel. The implications of the gospel is that now you have a new life you're living where you show forth the fruit of repentance and sanctification shows up in life and you see it. But don't get confused on that, okay? The other thing I'd give you as a warning is some people think sanctification is getting better at doing good works. And actually sanctification should be defined as moving, um, moving from unbelief to belief in all areas of life. Unbelief in Jesus to belief in Jesus in all areas of life. So the more that you see Christ for who he is, the more that you believe him in all of your life, the more you're getting sanctified. So it's not just 
wow, I used to be a bad person, now I'm becoming a better person. That's not, that's the wrong definition of sanctification. In fact, the reality is if you get sanctified, you'll realize you're a worse person the more sanctified you get. So you'll be like, gosh, I feel like I used to be a pretty good Christian, and now I just plain suck. No, God just knows that you believe the gospel grace is sufficient enough for you to finally see that you did all along. You just couldn't handle it before. So he's like opening your eyes, you're like, wow, I am really a mess. You know, and if you know anybody who's walked for a long time with Jesus, if they're growing in godliness, they are more impressed with Jesus and less impressed with themselves the older they get. That's humility. And that humility is because God has been kind and gracious enough to show them what they're like next to Jesus. And the more they get to see Jesus for who he is and who they aren't, the more they become impressed with Jesus. And that's, I'd, be, I'd rather have that definition of sanctification, that you're going from unbelief to belief increasingly in every area of your life in the work and person of Jesus. Okay? Uh, this isn't mine, but I'll give it to you. Um, this, is, this comes from World Harvest Missions. Uh, the way they kind of put it out there is they say, at first, when you come to faith, your view of God's holiness is not that big. You're like right here, okay? Just where you're at. And, and my sinfulness, I don't think it's that bad. But the more that I come to know how great God's holiness is, the more I see my sinfulness is far worse than I really ever knew it to be. And so the more that happens, the more the cross gets bigger and bigger in my perspective because Jesus becomes that much more amazing to me that he would have rescued a sinner like me and God's holiness was so great that the chasm was amazing. I could have never, ever become like God. So that's kind of, that's a better picture of sanctification if you're going to embrace one. Instead of the picture is all about you getting better and doing better. Okay? So, all right. Now, what I want to go through is this progression in Romans 1. And I'm not going to go through all of Romans 1 because I want to get to even keep pushing towards practical. But what I want to I at least show you, and I'm going to summarize it. I'm not going to read all of it. I'll, you can read it later. But here's the general direction. Here's the progression in Romans 1. God is clear and plain to people through what he's made. You can see his, divine, his, divine, his invisible divine attributes. Uh, so you can see power and might and glory and splendor and you know, I happen to live in an area where in my backyard I can see Mount Rainier. And so, you know, it's hard to not look at that mountain and go, wow, majesty, splendor, power, might. And, you know, what we've, do, what we've done as humans is we've said, I don't want to give God credit for that. So I'll exchange the truth of God for a lie and exchange the creator for the created. So I'll worship the mountain instead of the creator of the mountain. And that's what we do. And we do that with everything. And then what, what the writer says, what Paul says here is he says, because we do that, God basically gives us up in the lust of the, our hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of our bodies among ourselves. And he's going to talk in particular about homosexual sin, but don't miss this. He's not just trying to make that one worse than the others, because later he's going to tell you all of them. Okay, so he's using it as an example. Uh, and he's saying, you know, what happens is when we exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the created instead of the creator, God gives us up to that. In other words, he says, you're longing for something, that's lust, that can never satisfy, so I'm going to give you over to that, because you're going to look to something that's not God to satisfy you like only I can satisfy you. And I, because I love you, and I want you to be rescued from that, instead of me just giving you an illusion that it satisfies you, I'm going to give you up to it. And so you're going to, you're, in a sense, you're going to become an addict, and in fact, the room is full of addicts, just so you all know. Some of you are just addicted to different things. Some of us are addicted to people approval. Some of us are addicted to a perfect plan and strategy. Some of us are addicted to being, which would probably equal being addicted to control. Some of us are addicted to sex. Some of us are addicted to drink. Some of us are addicted to food. Some of us, I mean, all kinds of things. Some of us are addicted to work. But whatever it was that we started looking to, to be our God, is what God gives us up to. Okay, so... You, if, if you're looking at something to give you significance, to give you acceptance, to give you security, to give you deep abiding fulfillment, and it's not God, that's idolatry. And at the heart of every human, you're all worshipers. We're all worshipers. That the, at the core of who you are, you are worshiping constantly. Worship is not singing a song. Worship is building your life on or upon something. 
Okay, it's whatever you build your life on or upon. It's the thing that becomes the fulcrum of your life or the, the center of your life. It's the thing that determines your thoughts, behaviors, actions, and has the most influence in your life. That's what you worship. And all of us worship false gods at times. And God gives you over to that. And then, what, here's the beauty. None of it works. All your false worship doesn't work. It leads to a continual striving and desiring for more because it doesn't ever satisfy because you're only meant to worship the one who does truly satisfy and that's God himself. So he gives you over to that. That's what happens. And so he gave them over. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped the, the wrong thing. God gave them over. And then, 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. So what happens is when God gives you over to lust, which is craving for something from something that can never meet your desire, when he gives you over to that, then you realize it never, doesn't ever satisfy. So what you do, you pervert the thing. Okay, so parents do this with kids. Kids don't satisfy their, them like they hope because if you're a parent, you know, it doesn't take long for you to go like, okay, they're never going to be perfect. You know, like no matter how hard I try. Now some of you still are under the illusion that they're going to be. Just wake up, okay? They're not going to be. And so you try to control them. What you do is then you try to pervert parenting and pervert children and you try to make them something they were never made to be. And you put a kind of weight and pressure on them. And if you do this with sexuality, you'll get, get into all kinds of perverted acts in terms of sexuality. If you do this with drinking, you'll become a drunk. If you do this with food, you become a glutton. If you do this with work, you'll be a workaholic and you'll despise your boss because he never ever gives you what you'd hope for from him. And you'll despise your job, but you won't be able to ever stop doing it. And so you'll try to control the employees or fellow workers and you'll slander and gossip. And pretty soon, the dishonorable passions will begin to show up in terrible behavior. Okay? And that's the next part. So it goes from dishonorable passions to dishonorable actions. So verse 28, or before that, you see shameless acts with men. And this is, he's referring to homosexuality, but he doesn't just keep it there. Look at verse 28. Since they did not sit, see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So now, not only is it dishonorable passions, now their minds are so twisted, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And you go, that's right, those terrible sinners, what's wrong with them? And then you keep reading, and you realize he's talking about you. Because he says, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. You want someone else's car, or house, or wife, or job, or wardrobe, or good looks, or whatever. Malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God. Do you ever think that gossip is the result of idolatry? That's what he's saying. You gossip because of your bad worship. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Your kids are disobeying you because they're idolaters. That's why. They've done the very same thing. And then he goes on, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. What is he saying there? He's saying every one of us in the room has done this. And every single behavior that's destructive in our lives is a result of us first starting with the wrong object of worship. So every behavior can be stemmed back to wrong worship. Every one of them. In terms of sinful behavior. So what is he doing? He's, he's saying there's a, and I'm going to call it a fruit to root application here. There's a, it started somewhere with a seed of faith or belief or worship and it sprung up into a tree that produced fruit that was not righteousness. It was not the fruit of the spirit. It was, it was rebellion and it's the fruit of ungodliness and it's, it's destructive. So we're going to walk through that process here. But what I, what I want you to know is as we do this, the thing that we want to do in every place in which we've put our faith or trust in something other than Jesus, we want to ask the Spirit to help us see that Jesus is the better. Okay, that's what we want. So like someone comes to your missional community and uh, they're like, oh man, how you doing? Oh, it's a horrible day at work. Yeah, tell me about it. My boss is a jerk. Yeah. Okay, well, and usually you're like, yeah, I know, man, mine is too. And then you start complaining and grumbling, and, and already you're all giving in to false worship, just so we're clear. Like, you're, you're there. You went through the progression pretty quick. You know, you're already at the bottom. 
doing things that ought not to be done, you know, and let there be no grumbling, complaining, like, let no unwholesome come, talk come out of your mouth, only what's helpful for building each other up, and you're going, how did we get there so fast? Well, it was, it was the object of our worship was wrong. So instead of going like, oh, yeah, I know, it's terrible, da-da-da, we had to go like, wait a minute, stop, not the fruit of the Spirit. Obviously, our worship is on the wrong object. Who are we worshiping right now? We're worshiping our bosses. You go, no, we're not. Yes, you are. Because your bosses are becoming the fulcrum of your life in that moment. They're becoming the centrifugal force of your life that's controlling your behavior. Because you're going, my life is bad because of my boss. Do you understand what you've done? You just made Pharaoh. You made your boss into Pharaoh. That's what you've done. So you're like, my boss is Pharaoh. He rules my world. He is my God. Whatever he does either makes my world good or makes my world bad. That's my God. And, and so what, what, what do you need there? You, you need to repent. What does repentance look like? Well, no one can repent unless they see that Jesus is a better boss. Because repentance isn't stop your complaining. It's hold on. Got your eyes on the wrong God. And that's where we need to go. Oh, don't forget who your boss is. Your boss isn't that person who signs your paychecks. Your boss is Jesus Christ. He's your Lord. He's your king. And he's an amazing boss. Like, you want to raise? You're a co-heir with Christ. How can you get any better pay? You want a high position? You're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. How can you get higher in the company? You want more affirmation? God the Father says, I am pleased with you as I'm pleased with my son, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the, the one who's in charge of the universe. You, you, want, you want more accolades? He's, he's given you all that is Christ. You're a co-heir with him. Everything that's true of Christ is true of you. What more do you want? You've got the best boss in the world. Repent and worship your Lord instead of your earthly boss. And so now it's a, oh, that's right, I forgot. Jesus is amazing. I can go to work and go, man, I'm getting paid so well. It's awesome. I got high position. It's incredible. Nobody around here knows it, but it's kind of like, you know, that one show where the boss, the company boss shows up and he's like a regular employee? That's us. We're working amongst all the rest of the people in the world and they don't know it. We are, we are with the guy who is in charge of the universe. And we're just showing up in everyday life going, okay, just like Jesus did. Showing up, not getting treated well, not getting honored well, not getting affirmation. It's okay. You have a boss who knows. And you're getting paid. You don't even deserve to be paid. You deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But you get the wages of righteousness, which is eternal life. And you didn't even do the work. Like, it's amazing. Go to work for him tomorrow. And repent. You were worshiping the wrong boss. See, that, we've got to do that because we're all prone to fall back into the Romans 1 progression of, of worship, and we find ourselves not even aware of it, but we're worshiping a false god. Uh, I had a couple that was, had been, then been married uh, for a few years, having a lot of problems in their relationship. She had physically saved herself in terms of not having ever been with another man sexually, and he had been with some other women, and that was the, the center of their problem was her purity and his... his uh, licentious living and so they were struggling in marriage and as we were walking through this process of counseling with them um, I realized they both had worshipped the wrong God and for her she was worshipping her purity so she was looking down on him for not having saved himself and she was looking up on herself for having saved herself and she's like I'm good and he's not because of what I've done and what he's done and what, what we had to help her see was that was idolatry. She was putting her, her focus on herself and her own works, and she was impressed with her ability to save herself. And because he didn't, she was looking down on him. And we could help her see that what she had done was just as ungodly as what he had done. Because she had looked to her own behavior to make herself righteous, and he had also looked to his own behavior to make himself satisfied. They both were looking to somebody other than Jesus. And until she could see that her sin was just as heinous as his sin, she couldn't give grace to him because she didn't realize she needed grace. But when she realized she was actually opposed to Jesus by boasting in her own righteousness, then when she saw that, she needed, realized she needed the cross as badly as he needed the cross. And it leveled the, the playing field for them to now both go to the cross saying, we're both equally sinners. And for her, repentance was turning away from putting her trust in herself and her purity to the only one who's truly good and pure, and that's Jesus. Because even her best attempt at being pure wasn't pure. 
And for him, repentance looked like him looking to his wife to give him justification and acceptance and saying, I can't wait for her to finally say I'm clean and pure. Jesus says I am, and that's going to have to be enough for me because she may never say it, but he already has. So they both needed to turn away from the object of the worship to the true one who deserved it, and that was the better. Jesus was his better affirmation. Jesus was her better purity. Does that make sense? So, but if we, don't, if we don't know that there's a progression going on like that in everyone's heart, we won't realize that it's not just an outward behavior we're trying to correct, but an inward act of worship that already took place before the behavior. So we've got to get to the worship, okay? Now this is what it looks like. Uh, I, I told you I was going to use kind of, the, a, kind of a tree diagram, so, or a root to, root to fruit kind of thing. So I'm not a very good artist. You'll just have to forgive me for that. But uh, let's just imagine there's a bunch of fruit on the tree. And we want the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Um, we want the fruit of righteousness, which is love for God and love for other, love, as, love one another as yourself. See, that's what we want to see in, in real action. Uh, but when you see something that's contrary to that, what you want to do is you want to realize that you have to trace the fruit to the root. And there's four key questions that... I want to encourage you to wrestle with um, as you walk through this with people. There's this question of who is God? Okay, and at, at the very root, we have an image or a picture of who God is that's directing our life. Okay? And if it's not who God is as revealed in Jesus Christ, you're worshiping a false God. So, because He is the the image of the invisible God. He is deity in flesh. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus says. So, so that we want to move from who is God to revealed as what he, as through revealed by what he's done. So what he's done reveals who he is. And we always know that about God. God is completely holy, completely integrous. Every act is an action coming out of a character who, of who God is, Okay. So who is God? What has he done? And then this is where we ask the question, who am I or who are we as a result of these? Okay, and I'll, I'll show you this in Genesis 1 and 2. And then it's out of that that we do what we do. What I do flows out of my belief of who God is, what he's like, and who I, or what he's done, and who I am. That's how it always works. And uh, just as a, an aside here, the world looks at life this way. My doing leads to my being. Okay, it's absolutely backwards. Okay, you ever met somebody and they're like, hi, my name's Jeff. We'll do this together. Hi, I'm Jeff. Dan. Dan, good to meet you. What do we usually say next? Uh, how are you? How are you? Well, yeah, that's good. Thanks for asking. I'm doing well. Let's keep going. How's your day today? That's great. See, you're, you're a godly man. I'm so thankful that you care about me. Okay? That's typically what we do. Hi, I'm Jeff. You're? Dan. Dan, what do you no, do, Dan? I work for the stump. Okay, what do you do there? Uh, I do students at South Campus, so. All right, and we, usually keep, and we usually keep talking about what do you do, what do you do, what do you do, because the world largely defines who Dan is based upon what he does. But what if we said, hi, Dan, I'm Jeff. Good to meet you, Jeff. Who are you? I'm a son of God. There you go. Thank you very much. Good job. Yeah. Okay, what if we change the language and stop saying, what do you do to who you are? Who are? Hi, I'm Jeff. Who are you? I'm Dan. Dan, who are you? Not what do you do. But see, the world uses doing as the identification of who I am. Why? Because in the very beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, God starts saying, you are made in my image. Well, he gives us our identification, and we're supposed to live our life in light of that. What does the serpent come along and do? God knows that when you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like him. Wait a minute, I thought I already was made like him. And Adam and Eve forgot that they were already made in the likeness of God. They didn't need to do anything to become anything. God had already done everything to make them everything he wanted them to be. Now they were just operating out of who they were. And everything they did at that point was an expression of their faith in God and who they were. That's why be fruitful multiplies the command. Why? If we trace it back into the fruit to root and ask those four questions, in the very beginning in Genesis 1, who is God? He's the creator. How do we know that? Because he's what he's done. He has created 
because he is creator. Who are we? Adam and Eve, who are they? They're created. They are the created beings, created in the image of God. Okay, they're created by the image, by the creator. They bear his image. And what does God call them to do? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Does God go, hey, you know what? I made you. And you know what? If you, if you do this, if you are fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, then you'll become like me. You'll be like, like the creator. Because now that you've created, you've now made yourself into something. No, he goes, you are this, therefore do it. In other words, do what you are. The world says, be who you are by what you do. You are something because of what you've done. God says, no, you do something because of who you are. It's just the opposite. And the trick of the evil one over and over and over again is to flip this around on you. Is to say, your behavior determines your identity. Your identity then gets to tell the world who God is around here and what God is like. And that's just the evil one flipping it upside down. So now what you want to do is you want to ask the question, when you see fruit up here, what we're doing, it does reveal, though, what we believe. You need to know that. So I'll just give you an example. My wife um, has struggled with anxiety and fear. Okay? So she, she has that, that challenge, that struggle. Um, she, one day we were sitting down because she was really becoming a slave. You could tell she was not experiencing freedom in Christ and being free from fear and anxiety. Now, I, just so I say it and it's clear, I don't think anxiety itself is a bad thing. I think it's God's gracious gift to reveal something else that's wrong. Just like I'm glad I get a temperature when I'm sick. The temperature isn't the bad thing. It's actually my body working, telling me it's fighting something off. Clue in, something's unhealthy in you, Jeff. So anxiety is a good cue that God's given us to show that something is wrong. Okay, so I'm not trying to like, if you're, if you're feeling anxious, go like, I'm not going, shame on you. What's wrong with you? I am saying, however, though, do you know what you're worshiping? Are you aware of what your anxiety is telling you? There is something wrong. Anxiety is not the thing that's wrong. It's what's going on that's leading to the anxiety. And so with her, I said, I sat down with her, I said, babe, I want to just ask you the question, right now, who do you believe you are? Can I, in fact, I'm going to use a different sheet of paper just to make sure I have enough room. So, who is God? What I do? Who am I? And what he's done? So she's experiencing anxiety. I said, what do you believe about yourself right now? What do you think she said? She said, I believe I'm in control. I'm in control. I said, so why are you anxious? I'm not in control. That's what she said. I said, so you actually believe, let's be clear, you believe you should be in control of the world. So, well, if you put it that way, that sounds pretty bad. So, but that's what you believe right now. That's what you believe about yourself. I am in control. I should be in control. I'm not in control. I said, well, what do you believe about what God's done that would lead to your sense of anxiety? She said, I believe he's abandoned me. I love my wife because she is super, super honest. She doesn't play around. She's straightforward. Uh, I believe he's abandoned me. I said, anything else that you believe? He stopped loving me, she said. What else? He lost control and power. I said, what does that tell you about who God is? What do you believe God to be like? The God that you're worshiping, because it's true, this is all true about the God she's worshiping, just so we're clear. It's not true about the God, the true God, but she has a false God right now, okay? So I'm not trying to shame her and go, come on, you know he's in control. You know, and here's what we usually do, don't worry, be happy. Behavior modification, we think that's repentance. Anxiety, don't worry, be happy. So happy, repented. No, you didn't. Or we go, don't worry, be happy, God's in control. It's good, it's true, it's not the gospel yet. Okay? A lot of times we just give these 
kind of pl- these big answers, which are true, God's in control, you shouldn't worry, and they, they're not the gospel. And if you don't give them the gospel, they aren't going to get to God. It's only through Jesus Christ that we get to God. Though He's the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know the truth about God being in control? You can't just say God's in control. You've got to give them Jesus. He's the only way they're going to know the truth that God's in control. Does that make sense? It is true God's in control. They won't get it unless they get Jesus because it's only in Jesus that he reveals that God is in control. So she said he's, he's, she's worshiping a false god. I said, well, what does this tell you about your god? Well, he's absent, unloving, impotent. She said all these. And I'm just going like, wow. Most people aren't that honest. That's the God you're worshiping. And she goes, but I don't believe that. I said, I know you don't, babe, but right now you are. This is what you're believing. That's why you're experiencing this. And I said, well, what, what do you believe? And this, by the way, that question is key for leading people to repentance. For Christians, okay? We can talk about non-Christians. But for a Christian, it's like, what, well, babe, what do you believe? What do you believe to be true about God? And she said, I believe that God is loving. I said, how do you know that? How do we know that God's loving? The cross. Paul says, this is how we know God's love for us. In this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. You want to know God's love for you? You look to the cross. You cannot know the love of God apart from Christ. That's the way it works. We need to give them Jesus. Okay? So what else do you know about, about God? Well, she said, he's powerful. I said, how do you know that, babe? Because Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. That's right. If there was ever a time it looked like God was out of control, it's when Jesus is hanging on a tree, the Messiah of the world, the God-man is being killed and, and beat up and spit on and mocked by sinful people that he's dying for, and the God who comes to save is being killed and looks like he needs to be saved. That's as bad as it gets. There's not a darker day in history than that moment. Jesus hanging on a tree. And when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he cries out his last breath as he says it's finished and he dies. And you think, wow. Can you imagine all the disciples watching that, putting all their hope in this king who's going to rescue them and now he's dead and he's in a tomb for three days and you would think that's the worst day in all of humanity's history and in one hand it is and the other hand it's the greatest day there ever was because it's in that day where God is clearly not out of control but God was in control the entire time and it was his predetermined plan that this would happen to Christ so that death could be put to death and sin could be conquered and we could be set free forever. He is not out of control And if you're in a place in life and you're going, man, I feel out of control. I feel like God's not in control. I feel like, does he know what's going on? Does he know what I'm going through? Does he have any clue how hard this is? And the answer is he knows because he's experienced suffering in every way that you have and temptation in every way that you have, and yet he's without sin. And if there's any time that God ever knew what it was like to feel like it was out of control it's when Jesus is on a cross and he wasn't out of control so if he wasn't out of control in that moment he's not out of control in your moment and as I preached the gospel to my wife that's what she needed to hear and we talked about the resurrection and Christ rising from the dead and I said okay babe what about him being absent do you believe that God's absent she goes no I believe he's present I said how do you know he's present She said, because of the Holy Spirit sent into my heart, he's with me, I know it. He said he would never leave me or forsake me, and he hasn't. He's still here. So let me ask, when did repentance happen? As my wife is putting her faith in the truths of the gospel, we see repentance here, which is the turning away from the false god, She was worshiping to the true God. And then this is faith where she's putting her trust in that God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Her faith is in Jesus. See, that's repentance and faith. And it's that process that we need to lead people through, lead ourselves through over and over and over again. And the reality of of ongoing sanctification is that this has got to happen to us over and over and over again the rest of our lives. 
And it's going to need to happen to you again this week, 10 times probably. <laughs> and so then I said, babe, who are you now in Christ? He said, I'm loved like a daughter. And what else? I'm more than a conqueror through him. And what else? I'm not alone. So what does that lead to? Peace, love, joy, and on, on, on. Is this the fruit of the Spirit? I said, how are you doing right now, babe? He said, man, I'm doing a lot better. Now, just so you know, that was like an hour and a half, two-hour process of just me asking questions. I mean, I did it real fast here, but it was just me asking questions. Babe, what are you believing? Do you believe that to be true? Is that how we know God as revealed in Christ? No. Well, how, what is he like? How do we know? How has Christ revealed that? Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Do you want to turn right now from your false belief to true belief in Christ right now? Yes, I do. Would you take, want to take the time to do that? Yes, I would. And then we took time and she prayed. She said, Father, I, I, have, I believe lies about you. This is not who you are. Please forgive me for that. I know that you have. Christ died for this. You are loving. I see that in Christ dying. I, you are powerful. I see that in him rising from the dead. You are present. You sent your spirit into my heart. I worship you and you alone. And then the spirit of God grants peace in that place. Now, is she going to struggle with anxiety again? Absolutely. Probably, potentially, maybe the rest of her life. But the ongoing work is to continue to repent and believe and repent and believe and repent and believe the gospel over and over and over and over and over again. It never ends. See, the idea that you go, okay, I'm good. Me and Jesus are good. I'm a new creation. I'll never struggle again. Are you kidding me? The point at which you're a new creation, the enemy's going to come and try to destroy every bit of the work of Jesus in your life. He won't, but he will try. And our job is to keep saying, I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ that reveals the truth of who God is, and that changes who I am. And as a result, who I am changes how I live. And it's always that order. Get that order right. Okay? Like my mess up there. <laughs> so another way to see this is, back to the fruit to root, I was just trying to figure out what was at the root of my wife's faith. And then try to go back up and say, let's, Let's redo this. Who is God? How has he revealed himself in Christ? Who are you? New identity. And how do you live? There's new fruit. You see that? That's what we're doing. Okay? And um, someone was asking me in the break, like, you know, I have little kids, and one, one of the ladies said she has a you know, two-year-old, and she goes, you know, I, obviously what you did with your 9- and 11-year-old, you can't do with a two-year-old. Like, I know, they're not there yet. And she was, like, she was asking, well, how do you do this? How do you? I said, well, what you want to do is you want to have in front of you in the long run all the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and make sure that what you're putting into your kids on the way there is building the foundation for them to eventually believe it all. But if what you do when they're real young is the antithesis of what you're going to do when they're older, then you're going to actually have to have them repent of everything you taught them to get them there. So, like, it basically you're going, like, okay, little one, you know, like, you're going to get a spanking, and you think... I'm going to use spankings to motivate their behavior primarily instead of love to motivate their behavior primarily. Then someday when you say, you know what, if you, Jesus, when Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, they're going to go, wait a minute, I thought we only obeyed his commandments because we were afraid of getting smacked. I thought that's why we obeyed. No, 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 I, that's what I did for you because you couldn't get it, so I just smacked you to get you to behave. But now that's not how it works. They're going to go, what? So why, I'm not saying you don't give them a spanking or whatever. Don't hear that, okay? But I, what I'm saying is, what are you putting into them when they're young that you're going to unpack as they get older? You know, like, S sweetie, you just hurt mommy with what you did. We, we want to love people, not hurt them. See, when we do things that are wrong, it hurts. Now, later you're going to tell them the wages of sin is death. You know, you're going to tell them that. They're going to go, oh, yeah, you've been telling me all my life that rebellion and sin hurts. Now you're telling me it really hurt. Death. And it really hurt. Jesus had to die. You're going to build that. But when they're young, you're just building the foundation of those things, those principles. You might still tell them, God loves you. Jesus died for you on the cross. They're not going to make sense out of that. Over time, they will. But you're building that in. Same thing with the disciples that you're building into. You're asking yourself, how are we being consistent with what we believe in everything we do? Or are we, do we have all these inconsistencies where, yeah, we believe the gospel is good for getting them to Jesus and regeneration, but it doesn't work for anything else. Of course it doesn't. And then you use everything else to help them. No, it works for everything. For everything. Okay?
Any questions about this before I move on to the next thing? The, 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 those four questions are super, super important. And I'd say, think of those questions when you think of who is God. Think Trinitarian, and then think character. So Trinitarian, God is Father. Do this with me. God is Father. Say it. God is Father. How do we know God's Father? Through the Son. Okay? Yeah, we, the Spirit makes the Son known to us. I mean, so the Son revealed the Father, right? So you want to know what God as Father looks like? You look at Jesus. That's how you know God as Father. How, how, do, how does that become known to your heart? The Spirit makes Jesus known to your heart so you can get to know God the Father. Okay? Then who are you if you get to know that? Your sons, daughters, dearly loved by God. Not because of anything you've done, but because of everything Jesus has done. So then what do you do? If you're dearly loved children of God, what do you do? You love others, like brothers and sisters. Remember when Paul says, Beloved, let us love one another. Or John, for love is from God. And anyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. I'm doing King James there right now, aren't I? Wow, okay. Anyone who says he has love, or anyone who says he knows God but does not love his brother, does not know God, and the truth is not in him. Because if he knew God and that God was love, he would love. So that's what John says. So you clearly don't know God as a loving father because you don't love anybody. But if you love people, it's because you know God's love. He gets the order right. You love because you know your love, not you love so that you will be loved. Okay, let's try son. Who is the son in Matthew's gospel? Jesus is king in Matthew's gospel. He's, he's Messiah. He's Lord. We've got to get that back, by the way, in the church. I feel like Jesus this is like, He's Savior, but not Lord. Well, that's impossible. You can't have somebody save you from the, the kingdom of darkness unless he's got power and authority and might and strength and has a new kingdom that he's in charge of. It's not like you're going from rescue from the kingdom of darkness to just uh, nowhere. No, there's two options. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. If you went out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, it's because you have a new king. Jesus is your king. So if he's king, how do we know he's king? What did he do? I love this about Jesus as king. I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus says that's how kingdom works for us. In other words, what does he say? Most kings come into the world and they go, I need land, so I've got to go take it. But in order to take it, I need some soldiers, so I need to get some soldiers. And I'm not that smart, so I need some wise sages around me. And I don't have the money to buy soldiers, so I need some rich people. So I've got to get some rich people. And I, like, I don't have anything. All I have is me and my ability to influence and get things. So i got to get everything so I can have a kingdom. Jesus shows up and he goes, Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. What does he say? He goes, I have a kingdom and I have everything. I'm wisdom. I'm the wisdom of God. I'm rich. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm, I'm super, super powerful. I've got legions of agent, angels that can come and attack. Like, I've, got all, I've got the kingdom. You don't have a thing. I'm coming to give you a kingdom, not take from you because I don't need a thing. But you need me, and you need my kingdom. He does just the opposite. So I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give. That's his kingdom. So now we have a king who shows what kingdom life is like, which is give the kingdom instead of take to build a kingdom. And then what does he make us? If you're belonging to Jesus as king, who are you? You're a servant. So as a servant, what do you do? You serve. So see, it's not a matter of going like, okay, should I serve Jesus today or not? No, 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 no. You will serve a king today. Which king will you serve? That's the question. You are all serving a king today. The question is, will you serve King Jesus who purchased you with his own blood? You know, that's why even in the language of the church, get rid of this volunteer language. Nobody's a volunteer in the church. We're all servants. Volunteers are for non-Christians. Non-Christians might volunteer in the church. You may not let them, but... They're, the only people who are volunteers are people who go like, let's see, do I want to volunteer and serve in that today or not? But you and I are purchased with his own blood. You're not volunteering. You belong to him. He tells you what to do. This isn't a volunteer deal. You're servants. Okay? That changes your posture, right? God, I want to serve you today because that's who I am. Okay? You see how that works? Okay? You following it? I know it's after lunch, so stand up if you're getting tired. I told you that. All right. Okay, you follow in the order. 
Every behavior is coming out of belief, always. Okay. okay, let's go through a few other practical ways to do this. Are there any questions about this so far? And we can take a break if we need to. to what time did we get started? Was it 1.30? So we've been going about 45 minutes, just a few more minutes, and then we'll, if we need a break, we'll do a bathroom break. Any questions about that at all, this process? Now, to keep this in mind, I did it really fast. Please don't do this with a person. You're like, okay, well, let me see. I'm writing on a piece of paper. What, what do you believe in? You know, like, put it in your head. You know, think through. Okay, I want to love my brother or sister. What are, you, what are they believing right now? And you know you've got a template of whatever's coming out of their life is connected to what they worship and what that God is like. I want to help them articulate, articulate what they believe about God right now because that's what's leading them there. And you go, well, what do, you, do you do this with non-believers? Absolutely. I have a friend right now. Um, I won't say his name. Um, and he and I, we sat down. We were, one day I sat down with him and we were starting to eat lunch together because he, he said, I, I got some questions and we had been, our missional community reached out to him. We started doing poker parties and barbecues and cookouts and all that stuff. And he just came into the, the group. And I, as he and I got to know each other and we played some soccer together, he wanted to start meeting with me a little bit more, which is great. So we started eating a meal together. And I remember I sat down with the very first time. I, I said, I'm, just so you know, I'm going to bring my Bible because if we're going to talk about these things, I want to make sure you know this is my source. I'm going back to that. Um, so I, I said, I'm going to read from Romans 1 just because I want to I help you understand how your life works. And he's like, okay. So I went through and I did what I just did with you guys. I said, here's how it works. There's a progression. And then God gives you over. So you worship. I said, you are a worshiper. Let's just be clear. Um, and, and you may not know what that means. But what that means is you fundamentally build your life on or upon something or someone. And that something or someone has a controlling power over your life in terms of affecting your emotions and your behaviors and actions. And he said, okay, okay, if that's what worship is, yeah, I, I could see that. And I said, so if you worship something other than the true God, God will gives you over to that to let you see it's not a very good God. And then I just told him, like, you know, you'll probably want it to be something it can't be, and then you'll want it to become more and more, and that's what lust is. You're looking for it to be something it can never be for you. Uh, he goes, okay. I go, and then you try to twist it and to control it or hurt it or make it, manipulate it and... And then eventually you do all kinds of things that are destructive, probably. Hate that in your heart, hate that person in your heart, maybe despise them, whatever it may be. I go, so I just asked a question. I said, what do you think you worship? And he goes, my dad. I go, would you say that what I just went through is true? He goes, absolutely. He goes, there's some day at times I just can't stand my dad because he doesn't love me well. I don't feel like I've been trying hard to impress him and make him happy with me. And it seems like nothing works. And... I said, so what do you do? He goes, I try harder. And I said, what have you been experiencing lately? He goes, tons of anxiety. Because I've been wondering, I wonder if that's what is going on. I said, oh, if you're looking for your dad to be God and he's not a very good God, I could imagine you're quite anxious. And as I said, he goes, wait a minute. I, I don't think it's just my dad. I think it's my mom. And then we go through his mom and always what he's looking to for his mom to meet and give and serve and make up in his life. And we do the same thing. And then after we get done with that, he goes, I think it's my girlfriend. And we go through a girlfriend, and he goes, no, 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 I think it's my job. And I'm, like, we go through that, and I go, so do you think it's all for him? He goes, yeah. I go, see how messed up you are? You have four gods that don't work, and you're trying to please all of them at the same time. You must be schizophrenic. He goes, no wonder I'm so messed up. I'm like, anxious. And I'm, so then I go, see, the reality is God wants you to know that he is all that you are looking for in all of those places, in one God, so that you can serve one God and that one God can absolutely meet the longings of your heart for why you've been going elsewhere. And then I said, now let me keep reading. Because the Bible says that everyone who does this is deserving of death. Because you pretty much said, God, I'm giving you the fist. And I'm going to these people to be my God. You rejected God for them. Now don't you think God has a right to destroy you because of that? I mean, he made you, designed you, and you rejected him for people that were just made just like you. And he goes, yeah, I can see that. And I said, here's the good news. Someone else died in your place. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, came and said, I'll do it for Ziad and die in his place for the way he has looked to everyone else to be God. Let me take the penalty for that so Ziad can be set free. I gave you his name, sorry. And, uh, and he might also experience the grace of God. Now, I'll just tell you, he hasn't come to faith yet. 
I've done that with him over and over and over again. And we were together on our porch just last week with our mission community, and I speak very directly to him. I said, because uh, yeah, I was talking to our group about restarting our group, and, and I said, I know not all of you believe what I'm about to say, but, and I said, I know even some of you here are not even there yet, but I'm so glad you're here. And I looked at Zia, and I said, Zia, I'm just praying that God would, would break through, that you would hear him, that you would respond to him. He is, say, he is pursuing you. And he's like, man, I, I think so. I, I'm pressing in. I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite get it yet. I don't quite believe it yet, but I want to. And I said, well, that's probably from him. But you need to know, you can't make yourself believe it. He'll do it. He does the work of training, changing your heart. And so fun because Nikki, some of you heard me talk about Nikki, has come to faith several years ago as an older widow. And she, she goes, you need to know, he's with you even though you don't know it. Jesus was with me. I didn't, I didn't have the smarts to figure it out. It took me all these years, and I finally figured out he was with me all along. And he just opened my eyes, and he's with you too. He's pursuing you right now. I'm like, way to go, Nikki. Like, victory, you know? I mean, it's been six years for me to find, like, her theology has been all over the place. I'm like, it's getting better. <laughs> because it's, it's this kind of stuff over and over and over. It's a culture of gospel fluent people that are helping each other grow up into gospel fluency. Okay? So, with a non believer, you might do it that way. You know, I was pretty direct with them. You may not have to be that, you may not be that direct. You might be asking, how's your life and how's things going? And, they might have a conversation about their boss and go, yeah, I know. I mean, as long as your boss is, is kind of like your God, it's always going to be a problem because your boss makes a lousy God. And then you might be able to talk through what do they believe about who God is. You think, God's, you think your boss is a worthy God? No. Do you have any idea who might be? You know. By the way, if you're talking to unbelievers, don't give them too much. Okay, what I've learned is we're trying to like, dump on them what I just did all day long in one conversation. That's usually what we're like, Bleh! and they're like, thanks a lot. I'm never coming to meet with you again. Like, that was a little much, you know? And what I, what I tend to do is I just tend to give them enough so they want more. I was actually having a conversation with a couple guys last weekend, and they said, because we were talking about gospel work, and they, they said, so, like, how do you get in a conversation with an unbeliever? I said, I just say enough to make them want more. So... So I said, like, for example, you guys, you guys have a really great business. These are two businessmen. I said, I know you've done really well, and you've, you've employed kingdom principles in how you do your business, and I love that about what you guys are doing. And someone comes to you and says, another businessman, like, hey, man, you guys are really successful businessmen. Like, how'd you do that? Just go, yeah, we, just, we got some secrets that we figured out along the way. <laughs> really? What are they? Well, they're kind of about... We'd call them like kingdom principles. Yes, like, what are those? <laughs> you know what? You did, it's just like, well, we believe that Jesus is a far better king than the rest of the kings or rulers of this world. And he knows about business better than anybody else. He's the one who created the idea. And so we were trying to learn from Jesus because he's all about setting up a kingdom where everything works and equity takes place, and people get cared for, and people have their needs met, and so we're just trying to learn from him. And then stop. And they might go like, they might go like, yeah, I don't really, I'm not really interested in Jesus. Okay, are you interested in his principles? And then you might tell them about the kingdom principles, about him laying down his life, and, and you're going to get to talk about Jesus eventually. I've had parents come to us go like, man, we love your kids, like they really are well behaved, and you've seen ours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, like, how do you do that? Well, we just, we, we learned some really good principles early on in our marriage about how to parent. Well, what are those? Well, we come to believe that God is the best dad, the best father of all, and so we look at how God fathers and parents us. Well, how does he do that? Like, you just, don't go, don't, don't like go bleh on them. Say something. Like, I love the mystery. Don't you love Jesus? Like the woman at the well? I've got water that if you drank, you'd never be thirsty ever again. <laughs> really? Where do I get this water? Right? I mean, he does that all the time. See, here's the deal. If you believe that you have the treasure of the kingdom of God and the gospel, then you'll actually talk about it like that. But you won't just, like verbally abuse it with 
you know, quick talk, and, you know, you'll slow down. You're like, man, like, you guys seem to, like, have peace. I, I remember with, with, with uh, Clay, when he, he used to say, I don't know what it is about you. It's before he came to faith in Jesus. You just have, like, this, this power. I don't know what it is. Like, I feel it. It's a power there. And I live in the Northwest, so people are pretty comfortable talking about spiritual power, you know. I don't know what it is. I just feel it. It's like something's coming off you. And I go, yeah, I know. It's cool, isn't it? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, what is it? I go, that's God's spirit. What? Well, God's spirit is living in me. Really? Yeah, that's the power you feel. Huh. That was the end of that conversation. He was just like, huh. Eh. <laughs> and then I leave it. Because you know what? I'm building a foundation. Just like the kids, you're laying gospel foundations. And now he's going, you guarantee, I guarantee you, the conversation didn't end. He's walking home going, that is really weird. What do, what do I think of that? Like, God is in Jeff by his spirit. I do feel power. I don't think he's making that up. The conversation has ended. And I want his journey to go because I believe the Spirit is having a conversation with him. I believe that God is already at work in him. I don't need to make up a bunch of stuff. Like, just let God do his work and trust him. And so, next time he came back, he goes, You know, I was thinking that thing about power. So he said, I feel that when I'm on the waves, when I'm surfing. I said, Yeah. He goes, Man, I love that. That's why I like surfing, that power you feel. He said, It seems to be the same power that I feel when I'm with you. I said, well, that's because that's it is. He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, actually, God is sustaining the entire universe. And even the reality of gravity was God's idea. And the pull that you're feeling on the waves is God's power holding this all together through natural sources that he controls. I said, in the very beginning when he created, the spirit hovered over the waters. And his power has not left this place. It's still here. You just didn't know who to give credit for it. So, and I, he goes, huh, I don't know. And uh, I remember him going, I don't know if I agree with that. I said, well, here's the reality. You and all of us exchange the truth of God for a lie. We look at the created world and we don't want to say God did it, so we've got to give someone else credit, but you don't know who to give credit to, so you're stuck. So that's where you're at right now. Thankfully, I can worship when I'm on the waves and go, this is because of God. And what he's done in Jesus has made that real to me. But you can't yet. And that's where I'm at. And that's where I left it. We had those kinds of conversations for nine months. Just one after another after another. I didn't feel like it was my job to close the deal one time. Jesus had those conversations for three years with his disciples. Like it's just on and on and on. And they still didn't believe. And I just think we've gotten to this idea that like, conversion's got to happen right on the spot. And we, if it doesn't, we move on. It's like, no, if there's ongoing interest, just take your time. Be patient and enduring with people. It takes a while. And it's going to increasingly take more and more time in our culture that's becoming increasing, increasingly anti-Christian. Okay? So, we need a break? Think so? Okay.